what has been largely the focus of my work uh, throughout my career. And um, it's, I think, especially gratifying uh, that the work that has been ongoing in this time, and it's not just my work, it's many people who have been involved uh, uh, in this from various different uh, universities and countries, um, one of which you'll be able to hear today, uh, uh, Dr. Keith Nuchterlein, who have been involved in pursuing studies on the natural history and pathophysiology of schizophrenia. Um, but the reason why it's particularly gratifying now is because research often is something which is like a promissory note. It, 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 it's a, a, an agreement to pay off sometime in the future. But in this respect, I think the future is now in that we are able to translate the results of this research into clinical practice, and that's something that is happening around the world and in the United States, uh, uh, and hopefully will continue to be so to do so. So first, let me say that um, I am very active in consulting and uh, working with various pharmaceutical and biotech companies, but as my wife uh, regularly reminds me, I take no money personally. Nothing goes into my pocket or my bank account. Um, also, I want to at the outset say that in the course of my uh, career, I've had the good fortune in this line of investigation of working with a, a number of people uh, who have really been uh, uh, integral to carrying out this work. And uh, the newest group of colleagues at Columbia that really are responsible for much of this work are shown here on the right-hand column, but also pictured here. Scott Small, Lisa Dixon, Scott Schobel, Holly Moore, and Raghi Gerges. So the story begins with uh, what Kreplin described as dementia precox and what uh, really got his attention and enabled him to make the distinction between de dementia precox and manic depressive insanity was not the symptoms so much, but the course and the deterioration that seemed to inevitably occur in schizophrenia. Now, as a result of that, he noted that this intellectual deterioration was kind of like a dementia, but it occurred in individuals who were young in their 20s or 30s, second, third, fourth decade. So he called it dementia precox, early dementia, instead of senile dementia. Now, the focus of treatment, particularly in the ad, after the advent of antipsychotic drugs in psychiatry, tended to be suppression of symptoms, not disease modification. And we see this distinction coming into prominence now particularly with Alzheimer's disease, where treatments are labeled as symptom improving or disease modifying, meaning improve the symptoms or attenuate the course. So one goal that had been historically kind of overlooked was the disease modification in favor of this symptom suppression. But now, as a result of some of the data I will show you, I think we are in a position to be able to do the latter, to alter the course of the illness. So over the several decades that uh, modern research, particularly with an emphasis on neuroscience, has focused on schizophrenia, it has built a model of the illness which generally looks something like this. And I'm going to go through this rather quickly. We believe that genes have something to do to creating the vulnerability, not the certainty, but the vulnerability to develop disorder. It's not a single gene, it's many genes. They affect the way cells develop and function. Not all cells in the brain, but specific populations of cells, which then go on to form neural circuits. Now these cells and these neural circuits are viable and functional but they are vulnerable to malfunction under certain physiologic or environmental conditions. So this sets the diathesis or the foundation for which the illness can develop, but it's a probabilistic vulnerability, not a certainty that the phenotype will express itself. 
as many people have demonstrated, a number of environmental factors can influence whether or not the genotype will express itself. And in some cases, there may be full-fledged, what might be called phenocopies, entirely environmentally induced forms of the illness. Uh, Robin Murray will be speaking to you tomorrow, uh, who's been a major contributor to this work. So it is the interaction between the genetic vulnerability plus the environmental factors which can be increasing or protective of the genetic vulnerability. But then it's in the proximal stage of the illness, which is during the period we now call the prodrome, that certain other factors seem to come into play. And these are things like what happens in the brain during adolescence in terms of synaptic elimination, the effects of gonadal steroids, uh, myelination of long uh, axons to the terminal fields in the cortex, as well as environmental factors, stress, drugs, uh, factors of that sort. And these elicit the expression of the phenotype in these vulnerable neural circuits, which involve the uh, functions of perception, cognition, emotion regulation, and that produces the phenotype which we call schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, affective psychosis. And it's this model, or it's this, uh, uh, this body of research which has really given rise to what's probably been one of the influential theoretical models in the field, which is the neurodevelopmental model, which is that events that occur early, both genetic as well as environmental, induce this effect on the brain which produces a risk for, vulnerable, for vulnerability and dysfunction that can give rise to the illness later in life. Now, one of the things that was notable about the neurodevelopmental model, which was a very explanatory and powerful uh, hypothesis, was that it didn't necessarily fully explain what happened throughout the course of the illness. And the reason is, is that although the genes and the early environmental effects may produce this premorbid state from which the illness can evolve, um, the phenotype is largely unexpressed in this period. And it's only uh, after puberty, when individuals enter the age of risk, that the symptoms reflecting these neural malfunctions may begin to express themselves. But it's only then when the malfunction leads to such severe a uh, symptomatic expression that meet our ICD or our DSM criteria that somebody is said to have a first break of illness. And that's when we make a diagnosis and begin to intervene. The problem is, is that the illness could have begun many weeks, months, or even years after or, or prior to that point. Now, historically, there was a sense of therapeutic nihilism that treatment couldn't really alter the inexorable course of schizophrenia. Ultimately, it would disable people. Um, however, studies that were done in the 1980s and 1990s in early first episode patients, and these were done by a whole variety of people at the time. Uh, somebody who was uh, Dr. Nuchterlein's colleague, the Philip R. A. May, published a seminal study in the 1980s. Eve Johnstone and Tim Crow similarly published a study. Uh, <clears throat> Among these sorts. And then latter day studies in the 1990s showed that patients in their first episode treated effectively had a good level of symptomatic remission and a chance of recovery. The problem is, is that most patients went on to experience recurrences in the form of psychotic relapse, and as these occurred, they may not recover and experience this phenomenon that Kreplin had originally described of clinical deterioration. And this phenomenon is interesting in terms of brain diseases and degeneration because it isn't something like with Alzheimer's, Huntington's, Parkinson's, uh, spongiform encephalopathies leads to death. Rather, it leads to kind of a chronic stage where somebody is persistently symptomatic and functionally impaired, but they continue to live on. And this is the so-called end stage of the illness. So the question is, is can this deterioration be a target of treatment as well as the symptoms of the treatment be a target. 
And is there perhaps a progressive or neurodegenerative component to the illness as well as a neurodevelopmental diathesis? So studies, again, uh, conducted in the early 90s increasingly showed, and here uh, Dr. the late Richard A. Wy uh, Jed Wyatt was very instrumental in bringing attention to this, showed that in first episode patients there was an association for how long people were actively symptomatic with psychosis before they came to that first treatment intervention. And the individuals that were ill longer had lower and slower rates of recovery, and those that were ill shorter had higher and faster rates of recovery suggesting that the active phase of psychosis might be injurious or uh, progressive in terms of the uh, circuits affected in the brain. Similarly, if one followed first episode patients who had achieved a high level of remission, they found that if treatment wasn't continued, they had a high rate of relapse. When treated, they didn't necessarily recover to the same level as they had initially and even for subsequent episodes. So this prospectively defined what had been described previously as this stepwise kind of deteriorative process that can occur. And then with the introduction of magnetic resonance imaging and the ability to image patients and do post, uh, uh, do um, uh, computer-based image analysis, uh, it was found that if you look at patients particularly early in the course of illness and follow them over a several year period, you can find a subtle but measurable loss of uh, brain uh, gray or white matter in certain compartments, particularly parietal, frontal, and temporal. <clears throat> and when this was correlated with some of the post-mortem data, it was uh, uh, in hypothesized or interpreted as suggesting that the dendritic arbor which is associated with many of the pyramidal cells in the cortex, can become shrinked, shrunk or, or atrophy as a result of toxic, uh, toxic uh, effect of synaptic neurotransmitter dysregulation, which is associated with psychosis. So if psychosis is associated with a dysregulation in chemical neurotransmission involving <clears throat> dopamine and or glutamate, the suppression of this with medication might help to forestall the elimination of these synaptic uh, uh, dendritic uh, uh, spines and this shrinkage of the dendritic arbor. And this is a post-mortem photomicrograph showing the dendritic spines and uh, individuals with schizophrenia showing this loss or diminish, diminished spine density. So if one accepted the notion of there being a degenerative phase of the illness that underlied this progressive deteriorative effect, then the question is, is, can we modify it? Can we alter this as opposed to solely suppressing the psychosis? And again, combining treatment studies with the use of uh, serial imaging analyses, uh, it was able to be demonstrated. And these are data from Rene Kahn in uh, uh, the Netherlands that if you examine a cohort, in this case was 100 subjects over a five-year period, what you'll see is a slight reduction in the density of gray matter, which we could uh, uh, believe might relate to the shrinkage of the dendritic arbor associated with the synaptic neurotoxicity. When uh, Rene and his colleagues looked at the relationship between treatment, meaning how much treatment, how long had individuals remained on treatment in the interval, he found that looking at specifically clozapine, the more treatment somebody received, the less of the reduction in gray matter density. Now, this was the case for most of the antipsychotics, but more so for some than others. So, for example, when he looked at haloperidol, there was the same effect, which is that the more medication individuals had, the less reduction in gray matter density, but the effect was not statistically significant as it had been with some of the others, particularly clozapine. Now this raised the question, is it something about the atypical second generation drugs, which is neuroprotective in this sense, or is it just that these drugs are better tolerated? And if people are more compliant, they relapse less because they discontinue their medication less. 
Fair question. Well, most recently, uh, Keith Nuchterlein's group has uh, some data which seems to explain or at least suggest an explanation. They examined first episode patients followed with long-acting injectable medication as opposed to oral medication and found a significantly reduced rate of relapse and also a significantly lower rate of brain tissue volume change, suggesting that although the pharmacology may be helpful, it was the adherence which was the more important factor. So this led to kind of an iteration of the models that had been conceptualized to explain the history and pathophysiology of schizophrenia. There is clearly a premorbid phase during which the genetic and environmentally mediated abnormalities in brain development are induced. But this is largely silent, latent. Uh, phenotype is not uh, uh, largely expressed. When people pass puberty and enter the age of risk, there begins either in a gradual or an iterative basis the capacity for circuit malfunction in chemical neurotransmission, largely involving glutamate and dopamine, which can be suppressed by our current pharmacologic agents, antipsychotic medications. But if these are not sustained or introduced in time, then this process of deterioration can occur. And because our treatments are synaptic transmission modifying and not regenerative, once people enter this end stage where they are experiencing persistent symptoms, negative symptoms, cognitive impairment, pharmacologically we can do little to restore them other than using various types of psychosocial cognitive rehabilitative treatments. So the strategy to improve upon our current treatment uh, methodology was to identify people early, as early as possible, and to intervene and sustain remission. Of course, this can be done most uh, uh, appropriately and most uh, uh, effectively in the first episode of the illness. When people are diagnosable, they meet syndromal criteria, there's no question they have an illness. But people also suggested since the illness comes on in a gradual or iterative way, perhaps we could identify people during the prodromal period. Now this concept, which really uh, a number of individuals, uh, Pat McGorry in particular, have promulgated and disseminated around the world, has been revolutionary in terms of the excitement that it's generated. And there have been prodromal early detection intervention clinics springing up around the world. The problem is, as I'll come back to in a moment, is that the methodology is not fully developed to enable this to be introduced uh, as a standard of care. But the goal, nevertheless, is to identify people as early as possible that you are certain they are ill and treat them to prevent further progression. And where we can do that with certainty is identifying people during this first break or first episode of illness. Now, one of the things that has occurred uh, in the United States in conjunction with this bo a body of work has been uh, the NIMH funding a uh, series of what are called RAISE studies, that is re uh, recovery after an initial schizophrenic episode study, which tries to develop or uh, uh, examine the effectiveness of a aggressive, comprehensive treatment model for first episode patients. Um, and two projects were funded, one uh, uh, to myself at Columbia and Lisa Dixon, who was then at the University of Maryland, and the second one to John Kane and his colleagues at Zucker uh, Hillside Hospital. And these are the results of the study that Lisa and I were involved in. So the goal of this was to identify people when they could be reliably diagnosed as having a first psychotic episode by an ICD or a DSM criteria and introduce a comprehensive treatment program involving pharmacologic and psychosocial treatments. Um, the principles which govern this strategy is to not just suppress symptoms but to limit disability and foster recovery. And the second was 
to involve the patient in a shared decision-making capacity, not to dictate what the treatment should be, but to fully engage the treatment and utilize their input and their family's input in the decision-making process. The way it worked was that there was an outreach publicizing the availability of this treatment within the region, and when patients were identified as meeting criteria and accepted into the program, they were evaluated for what they needed among these different menu, this menu of different interventions, which included pharmacologic treatment, particularly with antipsychotic medication, having uh, supported uh, employment or education, depending on what they, where they were in their education or their work uh, history, assisting them with recovery skills for social skills and for a variety of other things, including cognitive remediation, supporting the family and educating the family, and also because suicide is of greatest risk in the early phase of the illness, having particular attention to the potential for suicidal behavior. And then when patients are engaged, to stick with them, even if they want to stop medication, uh, continuing to follow them so that if they relapse, they could have medication reintrodu reintroduced. Every patient was assigned to a team. There was a team leader who was at least a master's level clinician. There was a full-time supported employment coach, a half-time recovery coach, and a part of a psychiatrist as part of the team the patient was assigned to. And each patient had an individualized <clears throat> treatment plan that was established for them. So we studied 67 first episode patients, average age 22, uh, and uh, followed them for uh, over two years. Um, and the column to pay attention to here is this follow-up column, and this is overall. So this is the uh, retention rate over two years. So uh, you can see that if you go to the bottom, after two years it's 75%, which in terms of our data in the U.S. is extraordinary because the attrition rate in first episode patients who, when they recover, think this is over and done with and I'm out of here, is extremely high. Um, and the value of this was that it engaged people and kept them in treatment. In terms of how they did, this shows you a profile of some of the outcome measures. So this is a function measure. It's a global assessment of function. And it shows you that patients did increase over the two years they were followed. This is social functioning. This is their uh, participation in work or school as opposed to being inactive. Their overall CGI, clinical gro uh, global improvement level, their, their level of illness went down. And they achieved a level of remission and were able to sustain this over a significant period of time. So the value of this in terms of the outcomes seems to be apparent across dimensions, not just symptoms, but also in terms of level of function. Now, this model of care is hopefully going to be uh, taken up by the different health care providers in the various states and paid for by the Medicare, Medicaid private insurers that pay for health care. Because if there's no payment, it's not going to be adopted. But I think the inherent value and the potential economic savings is enough to persuade people. Now, the next step in thinking through this implementation of the knowledge we've learned over the three decades that we've done these longitudinal first episode studies is to move it as early as possible. One day, God willing, and science funding uh, being there, we will be able to identify people even in the premorbid phase, like we do with people who have cardiovascular disease. You know, if you have a family history of cardiovascular disease or you have specific genes that suggest that you're at risk for hypercholesterolemia, you don't wait till you have symptoms, even preliminary symptoms. Your pediatrician or your primary care doctor is telling you about diet, weight, smoking, exercise. And you could be put on a statin or any kind of medication to try and improve this. One day we hope we will be able to have those but right now we don't. We have to wait for some manifestation of the illness before we intervene. And the next opportunity would seem to be 
this prodromal phase. Now, the prodromal phase is a great concept, but it's a concept that, in my humble opinion, is not quite ready for prime time. And the reason is, is because we identify people based on fairly common, nonspecific types of criteria that are very common in the population of interest, which are adolescents. And it's hard to know what are the manifestations of prodromal behaviors and what are the wayward behaviors of, uh, of, of, of youthful exuberance. So these are the outcome data from the US Naples study, which is a multicenter study of prodromal patients. And they identified several hundred people, followed them for three years, and what they found was that the individuals that met criteria for these symptoms tended to have a conversion to a DSM psychotic diagnosis, but it was about barely 30%. So there was 30% that did convert, indicating the criteria were predictive, but there was 70% that didn't. And these would be called, in the parlance of uh, statisticians, a false positive rate. So if you were placing a diagnosis or you were instituting treatment to the 70%, you'd be treating them and labeling them possibly inappropriately. So what really is needed, or one of the things that is needed, is a, something that increases the specificity of the criteria. And one of these possibilities lies in development of a biomarker. So a biomarker is some measure, usually, of the biology or pathophysiology of the illness that has a specificity and sensitivity which produces a high true positive rate, a low false negative rate, and a low true negative rate, and a low false positive rate. Right now, we don't have that yet, but we do have several possibilities, and I'd like to spend the rest of my time showing you one of these. So working with a number of colleagues at Columbia, and particularly Scott Small, we uh, made a guess that schizophrenia didn't start everywhere at once. It began in some anatomic region, in some population of cells, and then was manifest along a neural circuit. And based on a variety of sources of evidence, we speculated that it was likely in the hippocampus. So the hippocampus is, as you know, anatomically an important structure in a variety of functions, but also it's geometrically very complex hence the name seahorse, and it also is cytoarchitecturally different, having different subregions. So Scott developed a methodology to use a, a high resolution, with good spatial resolution, MRI uh, imaging method, but would give functional results that was superior to what PET, uh, cerebral blood flow, and even fMRI with BOLD would do. It would give us high spatial resolution, but with a functional effect. And the reason is, is because we didn't want to look at atrophy, because atrophy occurs after the cell or the cell process has died. We wanted to look at sick cells that were beginning to malfunction, which is what happens in the prodromal phase. So Scott actually developed this technique for the use initially in Alzheimer's disease. And in Alzheimer's disease, he was trying to tell who is experiencing senior moments or minimal cognitive impairment, as opposed to having the beginning of what would be Alzheimer's disease. And he found that using this technique, people who had a hypoactivity in their entorhinal cortex were the ones that progressed to Alzheimer's disease. So we used a similar approach, and what we found was this. So these are the heat maps that uh, reflect the level of blood flow and metabolic activity in the hippocampus. And you see that in our control subjects, they're mostly blue and green, indicating a moderate to low activity in the resting state. But in first episode schizophrenia subjects, you see these hot spots in the CA1 and uh, sub, uh, um, uh, the CA1 region of the um, uh, hippocampus. And you see in the prodromal subjects this kind of intermediate effect. Now, when we looked at the relationship between cerebral blood at volume activity and metabolic activity and positive symptoms, we found a correlation. The higher the metabolic activity, the greater the level in these prodromal subjects, 
of psychotic-like symptom activity. And then when we followed these individuals for uh, up to two years, we found that there was a highly significant, a 0.8 correlation between the activity and the likelihood of converting to a DSM psychotic disorder, suggesting that this measure was a, a potential predictor along with the behavioral criteria to who would convert to a syndromal diagno uh, psychotic diagnosis. Now, at the time individuals convert to the diagnosis, schizophreniform disorder, schizophrenia, schizoaffective, um, they were then assessed again. And what we found was that the level of activity at baseline that occurred in the hippocampus had expanded within the hippocampus to other subregions. And if we looked at the areas of the frontal cortex, orbital frontal, medial, dorsolateral, prefrontal, we found that where it wasn't very uh, active here, it became active in this state when they had converted as opposed to in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So the idea is, is that the process of hyperactivity, which begun in the uh, CA1 subregion hippocampus, spread along a neural pathway into the, uh, door, uh, the orbital frontal medial cortex. Now, we also then measured the volume of the hippocampus uh, in these subjects. And what you see here is, the, uh, is a representation of the hippocampus using a shape deformation analysis to really assess volume change. And blue means no change from baseline to follow-up assessment. If there's orange or yellow or red, it means there's been a change. What you see is that most of the change is here in this front part. And this column shows you the corresponding levels of cerebral blood volume and metabolic activity measured by the functional measure. So you see that the reduction in volume, presumably due to an atrophic process, is related to the level of hyperactivity in this region of the hippocampus. And this bar graph shows you the relationship. So this is, shows you hippocampal volume, and uh, this is um, uh, CBV activity in region of the hippocampus. And you see that in this CA1 anterior region, there's a correlation between volume change and uh, metabolic activity in this region. So what we think occurs, and this is just another way of looking at it, I'm going to skip ahead. What we think occurs is that the cerebral blood volume and metabolic activity reflects chemical neurotransmission in this region. When it's dysregulated and overactive, the metabolic and the uh, blood volume increases. This predicts uh, suppression to, uh, progression to psychosis and also correlates with symptom severity. And it's a predictor of hippocampal volume reduction, presumably if treatment isn't, isn't uh, introduced. So the next question we wanted to answer was, what is underlying this increased metabolic activity and potential for uh, atrophy? We suspected, based on a variety of sources of evidence, it might be the uh, glutamate synapse. Um, and glutamate is a very complicated synapse in terms of the regulatory mechanisms. Um, I'm not going to go through this, but one hypothesis was it had to do with the NMDA receptor hypofunction that Dan Javitt has uh, 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 hypothesized some years ago, and that there's a gene that produces a hypofunctioning subunit of the NMDA receptor, rendering it hypofunctional. A second comes from uh, post-mortem microarray studies, which shows that there is an uh, underexpression of the glutamate dehydrogenase gene glutamate dehydrogenase being an inactivating enzyme of glutamate. So if it's underexpressed, you may have too much glutamate that isn't getting inactivated. And then a third has to do with the hypothesis of David Lewis and Francine Bennis of a diminution in GABA interneuron regulation of pyramidal cells, which may disinhibit these and allow for the overactivity of glutamate. In any event, we created an animal model 
of the human finding of increased CA1 hippocampal CBV. And this is the data from the patients that I showed you with the increase in CA1 shown here. In mice, we used a ketamine challenge. A ketamine is a drug that blocks NMDA, producing a, 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 an increase in glutamate. And you see this effect here in the same region as in the humans, which becomes uh, 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 overactive. And then to make sure that it was glutamate that was doing this, we put a microdialysis probe into the mice. And you see, if we inject them with placebo, or no, I'm sorry, if we inject them with glutamate, you get this spike in glutamate in the CA1 region, but in the neighboring region, which is the entorhinal cortex, there's no change. So this regionally selective uh, surge in glutamate. So the next experiment was to try and block it. So we used three compounds. We used gabapentin, lamotrigine, and we used the lily compound, pomoglumatad. Uh, pomoglumatad isn't shown here, but if you look here, you see CBV, and then you see glutamate, and you see the spike in CBV, the spike in glutamate. And then if you're pretreated with gabapentin, with uh, lamotrigine or gabapentin, you see this inhibition. And this is, this is data just with the pomoglumatad uh, pretreatment. But here's the, here's the punchline. Um, <clears throat> so now we've taken this back to the clinic and are conducting a study in prodromal subjects assessed with MRI to, assess, to evaluate or measure CBV. In those individuals, well, we're using all subjects, but particularly stratifying for those individuals with elevated CBV, we're randomly assigning subjects to placebo, supportive treatment, or gabapentin uh, and supportive treatment, and following individuals to determine if there is improvement in symptoms and, but more importantly, conversion. So the uh, idea is that prodromal patients have this dysregulation in glutamate neurotransmission, which is measurable before it really produces its destructive effects on the cells and can be treated. If not, this uh, produces a hyperactive state, which can lead to atrophy, which can further exacerbate the loss of GABA interneurons and leads to full-blown fulminant psychosis and potentially the chronic deteriorating effects of the illness. So the goal, and I think the ability that we now have is not just to suppress the symptoms, but if we intervene in the proper way, particularly early, as early as we can, to stop this historically disabling illness. That's the end of my presentation, but before I close, if I can have uh, one minute more, um, I want to make a, uh, uh, a self-serving <laughs> a self-serving promotional statement. Um, I spent, like many people, uh, most of my career being a researcher, you know, studying, but also, as um, <laughs> Professor Mai pointed out, a, a patient, I mean, a doctor treating patients. I am also a patient, too, I should add, but um, a doctor treating patients. But as I got more and more experience and more and more involved in administration, and I became chairman of a very large department that had to negotiate contracts and deal with the government, I became uh, radicalized. And as a result of this, I ran for president of the American Psychiatric Association and uh, thought that that would be a platform to be able to influence government policy, legislation, and funding, and maybe the media, which doesn't treat mental illness and psychiatry very well. And I did. But it was a very um, difficult and discouraging experience. And so as a result of that, somewhat quixotically, I decided I was going to write a book uh, for the public <coughs> to try and tell what I thought was a story that the media doesn't tell or hear. And it's about really what psychiatry is, what it can do, and whatever the misconceptions and the prejudices <coughs> were of the past, they're, they're no longer warranted. And the perpetuation of these misconceptions and stigma has the effect on the public of discouraging them from seeking treatment. <coughs>
when it is now available, and that's not good. So uh, this is coming out in March. If anybody's interested, I just wanted to make this, as I said, you know, promotional statement. So I thank you for your attention. Thank you.